Welcome to Forum Fest, the Westminster Town Hall Forum's new summer series that engages the public in reflection and dialogue on important issues of our day. My name is Tim Hart Anderson. I'm the senior minister at Westminster Presbyterian Church located on Nicollet Mall in beautiful downtown Minneapolis. I'm moderator of the forum. It's my pleasure to introduce today's guest speaker. Liz Winstead grew up here in Minneapolis, in Southwest Minneapolis, attended Southwest High School, class of 1979, and has gone on to great things. She is the co-creator, former head writer of Comedy Central's The Daily Show, and co-founder of Air America Radio. Both The Daily Show and Air America have been credited with playing key roles in mobilizing the youth vote in the last election. Currently, she is head writer, producer, and co-host of Wake Up World, a satirical morning radio show which she performs live with her comedy troupe, Shoot the Messenger. <laughs> She's a regular guest on MSNBC's The Ed Show, a frequent contributor to the Huffington Post, a columnist for the environmental magazine Plenty, and in between all of that, a stand-up comedian. Tonight, she explores the question that serious journalists all over the world are asking, as are many of us. What's happened to the news? Ladies and gentlemen, Liz Winstead. Yeah, you got to get a picture of me at this pulpit. Seriously. <laughs> My mother will not believe it. Nor will she even believe that there is a church in existence that would allow me to speak anywhere near an altar. <laughs> Never mind through its doors. Um, I, I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, this is such an amazing forum. It's been going on for 30 years. Uh, it has just opened up so many interesting conversations and dialogues with many amazing people. Um, to enlighten and inform, and I'm about to change all that. Uh, it's funny to, uh, to be back in Minnesota and, and to be asked to do this forum uh, knowing who Desmond Tutu has been here, and um, my mother said to me when I arrived, um, I saw the ad for this speaking thing you're doing, and I've heard of everyone but you. <laughs> Which on so many levels is why I have become a stand-up comedian. Yeah, I mean, it, it's a, it is a land that, you know, the thing about Minnesota is we do, we do have conversations, and, and that's good. And I love coming back because um, even folks, when they're irrational, will go, Yep, I think I'll just go then. <laughs> and it doesn't get as ugly as in other places. Um, so it, it's funny, with this conversation that a lot of people and a lot of you are having, um, and I'm sure a lot of you are having it because you're here probably because you are NPR listeners. And um, it sort of doesn't apply to NPR. When we ask what's happened to the news, um, the news is on NPR. And I'm finished. Um, <laughs> But really, it's, it's true, and, 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 and I ask this question a lot, and, and I ask this question, and it's funny that we're here on this particular day, uh, because it is the one-year anniversary of Michael Jackson's death today. And one year ago today, I was bumped from doing the Ed Schultz show to talk about escalation of troops in Afghanistan because Michael Jackson died, eight hours before. So he had bumped the escalation uh, of the troops in Afghanistan off television, and he had also bumped Mark Sanford off of television, <laughs> who I'm sure Mark Sanford has never stopped listening to Michael Jackson since. <laughs> so it, it, it's interesting. I left, I left today, I left the house. I was watching, and, and I'm going to talk a lot about cable news tonight, only because that is where most Americans get their information. It's an easy thing. They turn it on. It is, the, it is the medium that most people get their news from. So when you go, how can we have such an uninformed electorate? Well, it's because of that. Um, 
and, I, and, I, and, and why that is, is uh, I'll explain why I think it's happened, uh, what inspired me to create The Daily Show because of that happening, and then sort of where we go from here. Some helpful information, some just silly information, but we'll get through it as a team. Um, so I'm leaving the house today, I'm watching MSNBC, and as I'm leaving, the tease is coming up. Sarah Palin, Sarah Palin is giving a speech at some college. Sarah Palin is the second most covered, not a politician anymore, politician in the country. She sends a tweet on Twitter, and it's a two-and-a-half-minute news piece. Um, she quit her governorship, and during her speech about quitting, complained how Democrats are quitters. <laughs> and that becomes the meme. Um, Sarah Palin will be talked about a lot later in the show, because the rise of Sarah Palin and the power of Sarah Palin and the movement of Sarah Palin um, baffles anyone who thinks. <laughs> so the big question, what happened to the news? I mean, for me, I can tell you the specific pinpointed moment when I went from being somebody who told a bunch of jokes about not having enough sex you know, and, and my mom, and, and just general generalities, too, when I really felt like things were going awry, and I remember it so clearly. I'm, I live in New York, and I was living in New York, and I was on a blind date, and it was in the early 90s, and it, before there was Match.com and any of that, it was somebody said, hey, I know a guy, and no one knows a guy. Just <laughs> sidebar, <laughs> just no. Um, so I suggested we go see La Dolce Vita. It was playing at the Film Forum on a big screen. I was really excited. We go to the movie. He fell asleep. Um, and then he go, I said, well, let's, why don't we go have a drink and talk about the parts you saw? Um, Cause in Minnesota, we like to give someone a chance. Some marriages are 30, 40 years long with someone just falling asleep a couple, two or three times a day. And maybe that's the secret. I don't know. So we go to a bar, and uh, he said, I just didn't get it. And it was black and white. And I was like, oh. And we look up at the TV, and the first Gulf War, it was the evening of the first Gulf War. And the bombs started dropping on the TV, and there was a theme song, and graphics started flying in, and I was witnessing the beginning of a war on TV that felt like I was watching a miniseries. And I stared at the TV like this. Uh, and my date said, that is so cool. And from that point forward, I thought to myself, are they reporting on a war, or are they selling me a war? And that is the moment that I said, oh my god, the people who are supposed to be giving us the answers and digging for the truth are maybe in cahoots with the people who are planning. And I got really freaked out. Because as you know, I mean, CNN at that point was the only 24-hour news network. It was, that was it. So they owned it, you know? They owned it, and they had the ribbons and the graphics, and, the shoo -shoo, and it was all coming in, and you really felt detached from it. And nobody was questioning, and then they would just parade out every general who was ever a general. Remember? That's when we first started seeing experts who were like, really, General So? Really? That's a chicken dish, isn't it? You're really pushing it at this point. Um, and so we followed the war and followed the war, and then 24-hour news became something sexy that became something that advertisers could make money on. And that's the part, when you talk about what's happened to the news, one of the big things I like to talk about first is the fact that we have a commoditized media. 
and I could go on and on and on about what that is about, but I think in the most recent thing that we've seen lately that I'm sure has made all of your stomach churn, it is watching barrels and barrels and barrels of oil pouring into our ocean, seeing reports about it, and then seeing an ad with the president of BP on the network. Horrible, horrible. Then you have Tony Hayward in an ad with the unmitigated balls <laughs> to stand before America in a $50 million ad and say, BP is proud to be overseeing the largest cleanup in the history of America. <laughs> Which is like Ted Bundy saying, I am proud to be helping the police department in the largest manhunt for bodies in history. <laughs> but who do you believe when, we are, when we're finding out these, these people are paying for advertising on a network? Are we getting the real coverage? What are we getting? And it feels crazy. And it feels crazy that we don't really have journalists anymore. We have um, ex-pageant runners-up. We have failed politicians. We have failed lobbyists. Basically, if you weren't good at the job you were doing and people voted no, you get to be on TV. <laughs> and, and you just, you, you watch it. And, and then what happened was as the war, the first Gulf War dissipated, there was all this time to fill and they didn't know what to do with 24 hours of news. But they had to keep the sexiness of the war going. So you remember what happened. It was the trial of the century of the week. Every tri OJ trial, people shaking babies trial, blondes in peril, children disappearing, or maybe children not really disappearing, but the threat of maybe children disappearing, or any kind of news story that began with, what you don't know about your blank will kill you. And they would go on. And this, so this, they started the fear-based thing kind of early. And you really forget how they really tried to scare you at first. And at first it was products that'll scare you. Someone's going to steal your kids. Someone's going to steal your daughter as long as she's white and blonde. Um, and it, you just started with this fear. And, and when you're afraid, as we all know, you go shopping, as we were told for the products that they're launching. And so as these emotions started generating, that was exactly at the time that Comedy Central had come to me and said, we want to do a show that responds to the world. Um, what do you think? And I said, I, I would love to do a show that responded to the world. I said, the most important thing for me, though, is that everybody's on board, that we recognize that it's not just talking about politicians and, and corporations that screw up. The media is now complicit. So if we can become the media and show who they are, then I think we have leverage with which to do this. And as this had happened, and this was 1995, and as this was happening, there was rumblings of more cable news networks happening. MSNBC was rumbling they were going to start. Fox was rumbling they were going to start. And so we have, what, 24, 24, 24, what is that, that math, math? No? All right. <laughs> Too many hours of news to cover. So when we launched The Daily Show, the, interest, the, the most fascinating thing about it was it wasn't the comedy writers who came pounding down the doors to work on The Daily Show. It was journalists. Journalists who were fed up with being shoved at the Jeffrey Dahmer trial for three months. Journalists who actually knew the craft and were so desperate to make fun of it. And we hired tons and tons and tons of disgruntled journalists. If you want to know why The Daily Show works, it's because it was created by the people who used to actually tell us the truth, and now they're telling us the truth through fake news. Happy? <laughs> it's a little crazy. Um, and what's interesting is people, people talk a lot about The Daily Show and they forget that when we launched, and this part is so completely insane, there was no Google, there was no YouTube, there was only newspapers, there was the internet. So we, had, we got 50 newspapers, we divided up our staff into regions, 
And we went and shot all of the footage. And it was crazy to think that we pulled this off because now this machine that is The Daily Show can call the hypocrisy with YouTube, with footage, just you just run tape on all these 24 hour news networks constantly. And I don't know if you remember, I think one of the finest moments of The Daily Show was during the 2004 election. I think it was the 2004 election when they, they ran George Bush debating himself. <laughs> and on every single topic, George Bush countered himself. <laughs> and it was a thing of beauty. <laughs> but they did unleash, the MSNBC, when it launched, unleashed some of the people who I personally don't think are helping the dialogue. Um, Michael Savage was unleashed from talk radio. Alan Keyes was unleashed on MSNBC. And Ann Coulter and Laura Ingram had a, had a sister act going um, that was an epic disaster for everybody. But they became famous because of it. And then Fox launched with Hannity and Combs and with O'Reilly. I know. And I remember as this was happening, and it, ha it just kept unfolding, I thought, is this the result of Reagan closing down all the mental health facilities? <laughs> they have nowhere to go, so they're just going to be on television. <laughs> and, and we just saw, we saw the culture grow, and then 9-11 happened. And I'm going to just kind of skip through chunks, because if I were to talk about just the things in the news, we would be here forever, and nobody needs that. Um, especially me in a church, and I don't want you to get any funding cut or lose any people, patrons that come. But um, so the 9-11 happened, and what ha it, interestingly enough and frighteningly enough, when 9-11 happened is really when we stopped talking to each other as a, as a nation. That is when we could no longer question our government. If you questioned your government, you were labeled a, a, a one of many things, um, as has been continued on our president, he's either Muslim or socialist or fascist or communist or you can't be all of them. Somebody needs to tell the people that you can't be a Muslim and a Nazi and a communist and a fascist. It just, they just don't really meld. And they didn't all wear that mustache. But we, we stopped talking and the media the media carried on a war uh, based on information that it was giving itself. We learned some really startling facts. Uh, we learned that Dick Cheney was a major source for the New York Times war coverage, and then Dick Cheney would go on, meet the press, and cite the New York Times article that he was the source <laughs> as a source. We. They lost Phil Donahue. He was the number one progressive commentator in cable news, and they fired him because he wouldn't beat the war drum. And it was amazing that to simply ask a question of our government, you were shut down and shut out. And I'll tell you that if The Daily Show wasn't already on television, it would have never made it. I went through a two-year period where social satire was left off of the table. Every single network said no. You cannot talk about anything that questions what the government is doing. We stand by the government. We will embed our reporters with soldiers and give the story to the American people that we want them to know. And they wanted to dumb us down to the point where, A, we stayed afraid because we didn't have information, and B, we didn't question anything. So that when we started to unravel and the truth started happening, and we realized that that yellow cake uranium was really probably just some nutmeg, <laughs> and that we were spending dollars and dollars and dollars on a war that we really didn't know where it was going, um, and that we were spending lots and lots of money um, creating this, it was a we created this sort of bubble of it created a bubble of hatred. And what happened was people who lived their lives 
thinking openly that other people should just be able to live their lives and they're just trying to get ahead and work were demonized and those who had a belief system that was sort of founded on hating gays, hating abortion, hating stem cell research, hating science, um, they got to have a belief system that was perpetuated and validated and they were told that that is the way America thinks. And that's a sad, sad place to be. And the anger of that is what fueled me because I never understood how anybody else's lifestyle ever got in the way of mine. And this big threat, I've never been threatened by anyone else's marriage. I've pretty much had a lot of crappy relationships. <laughs> and none of them were crappy because somebody else had one near me. <laughs> pretty much the two people involved in my relationship were responsible for that relationship. And yet we would feel ju horribly judged. I mean, it just in a way that felt like, why isn't anyone in the media challenging people on the reality of these statements? I will never forget watching the last election and during one of the first Republican debates, um, 10 guys on stage, guys, Chris Matthews is the moderator. Chris Matthews says, how many of you believe in evolution. Three in 10 hands go up. At that point, Chris Matthews should have said, great, the seven of you can leave, <laughs> and you three move in so we can talk to sane people. Because <laughs> here's something that always confuses me. I believe in God, and I believe in faith. But what I don't understand is when people who believe in faith don't understand that their God also made scientists. <laughs> Gave them something to go on. And, and, I, and I can't, and, and I hear, and, and it's crazy when you hear, especially when on topics like religion um, and topics like the environment, when you watch on cable news, when they have spokespeople <clears throat> they have spokespeople on who are cartoonish versions of people who are crazy. <laughs> right? You never have a scientist on talking about the environment. You have, they have Michelle Bachman on. <laughs> now, her hair is darling. real cute. <laughs> Just worry about that sixth district. <laughs> How bad is the meth problem there? <laughs> I worry. I worry. <laughs> Just saying I worry. Because <laughs> there's things that the media should never allow and things that we should not put up from them. One of the things that we should not put up from them is they do, that they do have an ideology. And I don't care if it's the ideology that's from the left, I don't care if it's from the right. A good thing to always remember and watch is if you see a politician who only goes on one network that is friendly to that person's views, never vote for them. Don't vote for them. Because they do not have a courage of conviction to stand up to anyone. That's the bottom line. Rule that person out. Why aren't you going? I don't care. Go on Fox. Let Bill O'Reilly either show who he is by not listening, because that's what bullies do. They don't allow you to talk, they just interrupt. It's pretty lame and pretty obvious. Um, and Glenn Beck, I don't even know. That, that's just, he should be hospitalized. Because <laughs> that is not journalism. It's barely entertainment. It's like live NASCAR. You just watch a human being race around the track until they crash into a blackboard.
But the anger is real. And what's interesting is the, the anger that has bred the Tea Party movement is based in an anger that I understand, based in facts that aren't really facts. It, it bore out of Fox News. Um, and when you watch the repetitive nature of Fox News and how, when presented with the facts, carry on, um, you really see this talking point society. Um, and I, my mother is somebody who has hook, line, and sinker, and um, watching how healthcare unfolded. And my mother's 88 <clears throat> and half deaf and watches Fox News. So she gets half of half of the truth. And often I wonder if, the, if, if, if elderly people just watch Fox News because it's the loudest news. <laughs> and, and has handicapped parking or something. I don't know. Um, I can see it at night. Fair enough. But when I, but when I watch anything, whether it's someone I like, like Rachel Maddow, who I believe is a terrific um, broadcaster. Uh, yeah, she's terrific. <laughs> who actually is concerned about resources and facts. And after you watch an episode of Rachel Maddow, she has links on her blog and on her website where you can fact check every single thing that she says. And that is the key, is follow, follow, follow the facts. If somebody is spewing the same talking points over and over again, the latest one that drives me insane is, Barack Obama turned down international help. Of course, it's Sarah Palin and Michelle Bachman screaming um, about socialist countries helping. Um, a, but B, if you were in the Gulf Coast, there are 15 flags from 15 nations in the Gulf helping. Now you can point that out to people and they'll be like, well, that's not the fact I want to know. Well, you know what? <laughs> this is part of the problem. You can't have a different set of facts. <laughs> and the media knows that the media is culpable. And I think one of the biggest things that I recognize when, did, did a lot of you see Stephen Colbert when he hosted the White House Correspondents' Dinner? Did a lot of you realize that that was the first time in the history of the Bush presidency that he had to sit and listen to the litany of his failures for the first time ever? He had never, ever had somebody tick off the facts of his pregnancy. Of his pregnancy. <laughs> I am pro-choice. Um, and the media as well. He, he took on Bush and he took on the media. And if you'll notice, the reports from the media on how Stephen did, they trashed him. He was awful. It was terrible. It wasn't funny at all. It was brilliant. And everyone thought so. Who watched it? Who didn't work in the media? But he pointed out every single flaw of our, of our media. And, 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 and to me, when that happened, that's when I realized Oh my God, we are just, we're doomed. We're doomed. We're doomed because the, we have fully and utterly now become the world of commentary. You people know that because I know you don't get your information solely from cable news. You guys read, you probably read the internet, you listen to the radio, um, but it is full frontal commentary. And it is absolutely unacceptable to have 24-hour news networks where merely you pay people millions of dollars a year to wonder aloud on television. <laughs> it's shameful. It's, you watch it. They're, you're, you're at home going, I wonder how they could possibly drill 5,000 feet in the ground without ever having invented a thing that would fix something if something bad happened. And so you turn on your piece of media hoping someone will give you an answer. Instead, you get a guy getting paid 
millions of dollars more than you going, how is it that they can actually drill down there without ever inventing a thing? <laughs> or they ask you to Twitter them. Send me a Twitter. I'd like to know what you think. I would not like to know what you think. <laughs> I would like to know the facts. That is what I would like to know. Um, where are we heading? I don't know. I mean, that's the part is, that's scariest is I don't know where the media is heading. I do know that where it's at right now um, is, is breeding a divide. We used to be able to go home for family dinners and have political discussions with family members we disagreed with without guns. I mean, remember the days of old when you just thought the other person was an idiot? <laughs> you know, you're too conservative, you're a dreamer. And then, you know, you'd make up. Now it's just a demonization of epic proportions. And I don't know where we go, but I do know that um, you can arm yourself with the facts, which is, I feel very positive about that. I think humor as a tool um, is incredibly important. I think when you, you shouldn't use The Daily Show as your only source of news. I find those facts frightening when I hear those statistics. Um, but use it as a source of relief. The fact that we're all here means that we all know that there's a sham going on. <laughs> and there's a little comfort in just gathering and being in a group of people who actually aren't afraid to challenge things. Um, I find if you have to watch Fox News, Using the Vuvuzela while doing it is helpful. <laughs> but I think the most important thing that if someone invented that would help tremendously, and this is a little crazy, but I think you're going to agree that it would be a good idea. Um, how many people here are dog owners? A lot of dog owners? Yeah? Uh, you know the bark collar? <laughs> if they could invent a fact-checking bark collar <laughs> that every time somebody delivering anything on television that was information-based was a lie, they would get zapped. <laughs> I think that would be um, the start to a beautiful path towards the truth in our media. And I will close out with that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Liz Winstead. You're listening to Forum Fest, the Westminster Town Hall Forum Summer Series, broadcast from Westminster Presbyterian Church on Nicollet Mall in downtown Minneapolis. I'm Tim Hart Anderson, Senior Minister at Westminster and moderator of Forum Fest. Our speaker tonight is comedian and political commentator Liz Winstead. While the ushers collect questions from our in-house audience, I invite you to join us for future Town Hall Forum events. Information on upcoming events can be found at westminsterforum.org. And now, Liz, if you would return to the pulpit. Yes. I will present the questions from our audience. Let me begin by asking you where you get your news. Uh, where I get my news? I get my news from a whole bunch of different sources. Um, I, I scan, or I read every, I read the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, the New York Times um, every day, just as a baseline of information. Um, depending on the big story of the week, I will look at um, that region's papers, Times-Picayune, you know, or the Houston Chronicle, if you're watching Enron, wherever those stories are, or the, where the Gulf is affecting, I will read those papers. I read The Guardian. <clears throat> the UK Guardian, and then I scour various blogs. Uh, media Matters is a great website that actually tracks the lies of the media, the falsehoods of the media. Um, so I, I read a lot of things. This questioner asks, does the mainstream media play too nicely when someone makes blatantly false statements? Shouldn't they 
go after him or her and ask, well, I can't actually read what this question asks, but, but I, I, I think you I get, get the it. general drift of it. You know what, some of it's playing too nicely, but some of it is a, is a bigger problem for me. And a lot of times when we talk about the problem with the media, we often focus on the, the, the big carnival barkers, you know, the Glenn Becks and the Rush Limbaugh's. And I think, to me, where the bigger crisis may lie is in the hosts that are seemingly uh, rational, um, but don't have a lick of smarts. You know, they are not, brought, they're not journalists. And so you have somebody who's not yelling and not bombastic, but doesn't have a command of the facts, doesn't have a command of history, didn't go to journalism school, interviewing someone like John Boehner, who is, you know, the second in command in the House of Representatives, laying out a falsehood, let's say, that person doesn't know how to counter it. And I think that is one of the biggest problems that, of uh, the mainstream media. <clears throat> Who, besides The Daily Show, is keeping media and politicians accountable these days? Well, um, Media Matters, I mentioned, it's a website called Media Matters for America. Um, there's also a new organization called PolitiFact, and I don't know if you've heard about them at all, but they have started fact-checking um, ABC this week. Uh, my problem with them right now is in their fact-checking, they haven't differentiated the big important stuff versus the other stuff. So let's say you're on and you say the capital of uh, S South Dakota is uh, Bismarck. Oops, I'm sorry, I meant to say Pierre. Um, they'll say, they said the capital of South Dakota was wrong. And if you say Dick Cheney had nothing to do with our horrible energy policy, they give it the same weight. <laughs> yes, it's a problem. Um, think progress is great. Um, I think that you can also do it yourself. Something that I think I've had to teach myself to do when I read news stories, and, and now that I've taught myself, I feel like I'm a little bit smarter. And that is, have you ever read a news story? And, and I know you probably all have. And you're reading a story, and a name will come up that they, so-and-so has been nominated as the new secretary, blah, blah, blah. And you've maybe never heard of that person, and you just keep reading the rest of the story. Stop on every name that you don't know. And go, first go to Wikipedia, because it's just easy. But then Google things like lobbying firms and this guy, corporate interests and this name and all of a sudden you will unravel. And I'll tell you a real quick story. That's how I discovered how much Tom DeLay was a creep. <laughs> because I was like, Tom DeLay is kind of creepy. Um, and then I Googled Tom DeLay, um, former job. And he was an exterminator, which I did not know. <laughs> then it was Tom DeLay, then I Googled Tom DeLay, pro-extermination. And then I found out that Tom DeLay got into politics because he thought that the chemicals in bug spray shouldn't be regulated. They should be more chemically. <laughs> and then I found out that he had all these affairs and they called him Hot Tub Tom and all this other stuff. <laughs> um, but so you just can follow your own paper trail, create your own game. You really do learn a lot. And, and if you have a Facebook page, post every single thing you find. People do read it, and they do see it. And start a dialogue there. God, if that's where we're going to talk, talk there. Are there shows like The Daily Show in other countries? Do other countries have to satirize their news to get to the facts? <laughs> yes, England has shows like The Daily Show that are actually even more brutal and have had them for years. And it's not an anomaly. I mean. Even the way they run government in England, you know, when they have those big parliamentary shakedowns and they make the prime minister stand before the parliament and he has to hear about his job, like, we should have that here. Why don't we have that here? How great would that be to, for a president to have to stand up and hear? So not only do they have comedy shows, they have something called real democracy. It's so weird. <laughs> Many young people today get their news from shows like Comedy Central. Is this good for American democracy? <laughs> well, the one thing I can say about The Daily Show is um, if you fact check it, it will come out clean as a whistle. They, it's, a, it, it's as important to be funny as it is to be correct on that show. And it, the truth is not taken lightly. And 
what's interesting is that we now have a situation in our hands where comedians have become the watchdog of the watchdog. And sometimes I resent it. Sometimes I would just like to have a catharsis screaming about my mom and how she's destroying my self-esteem on a daily basis. <laughs> but I feel like that's frivolous. And so yeah, with The Daily Show and Colbert, yes, you can feel free that uh, those shows are good. And I think Bill Maher does a nice job, too. I just wish it wasn't all on the shoulders of social satirists. We have other things to do. One of our listeners asks, is the media liberal? Yeah, don't you see all the liberals on TV <laughs> making policy change constantly? Um, people love to ask that question, and I will answer that question by something my mother said to me that is very telling, is the perception of media outlets being one way or another is very strong. And my mom actually said to me one time, I get both sides. I watch, I watch Hannity on Fox, and I watch Lou Dobbs on CNN. <laughs> <clears throat> the media doesn't have a liberal bias, and neither do facts. Facts are inconvenient to someone who does not want to believe the truth of what's going on right now in the world. And if you consider facts liberal, then yes, facts are liberal. Yay, good. <laughs> All right. Why is it that Rush Limbaugh and Glenn Beck have attracted such a large audience if they've strayed from the facts? Because it's like having, if you had a parent, and, and you, when you were a kid and you woke up every day and your parents are like, you don't have to go to school. You can just eat ice cream all day and you don't have to go to school and we're just going to hang out and, it, and everything is going to be fun and great. I think that's who they are. They tell people what they want to hear. They can create, it's sort of like I was talking about earlier. I feel like what they do is they foster this fervor that is a belief system that allows, that requires nothing of you as a citizen. To have an anger-based belief system doesn't ask you to fix anything. To have a progressive system of values means you have to get out there and you are required by your community to be part of it, and you wanna be. And you know that that is part of the joy of being alive. And so when you tell people, just stay on the couch, and if you just like judge the gays and judge the you know, stem cell people, and we'll fight the war over there, and you can just hate those people we're fighting. Just stay on the couch, it's great. You can just have hot pockets and judge, and you don't have to get up. So, I choose the latter. I, 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 I hope that people would understand that it is so lovely to know who your community is and be part of it and be part of the world. You're a little part of it, you know? what One piece of fabric and carpeting is stupid. You want to be part of the whole carpet. <laughs> or something, that was stupid. <laughs> Edit that out. Do those of you who put together The Daily Show consider yourselves comedians or journalists? Comedians? Um, I think comedians and people who just care about exposing hypocrisy. I mean, my political, or my, my comedic philosophy is if you have been given, the, if, if the people of the world have given you in some way, shape, or form uh, the gift of power and you choose to abuse it, then you will be my target. Simple as that. Doesn't matter what political stripe you are or whatever. Don't abuse your power. It's a gift. Any comments on the recent Rolling Stone article, the magazine article? Oh, about yes. Yeah, right. Such comments I have. Um, I re have you read it? Has it, have you guys read it? Do this to entertain yourselves when you read it. Read it, and every time McChrystal or his people are speaking, have into your head valley girl voices. <laughs> they sound like catty sorority girls talking. Literally, at one point in the article, they say, oh my God, he had to go to Paris to meet a diplomat, and that is so gay. <laughs> Diplomacy is so gay. It's actually in the article. 
So when you add the voice and you read Joe Biden, I mean, bite me, you know, it's really <laughs> astounding and awful. And the hubris with which these people think that they can speak, I mean, it is shocking. I, I hope that what happened is that McChrystal walked into Obama's office and Obama said, you're fired and you're gonna sit here for the next 29 minutes and 59 seconds in silence. <laughs> Does President Obama have a sense of humor? No. Right? I mean, I really want to say, wow, he's awesome. And he was, he, was, he was fine at the White House Correspondents' Dinner, but I think he doesn't. I just, I don't, he, you know, I just think he's a little, he's exactly one day older than me. My birthday's August 5th, 1961. He was born August 4th. Um, so my mother says I was conceived the night Kennedy won, so I guess Obama was too, probably. Um, <laughs> which is awesome. Oh, no, right, he was in Kenya or something. I forget. But, um, <laughs> took you a while. God, people. No, I wish he could step up his comedy game. It's a little bad. Question about technology. Do you consider Twittering, blogging, and the preoccupation with the latest technology dangerous for democracy or helpful? Gosh, you know, <sighs> Uh, it, it, that's a double-edged sword for me. What I have, I feel like if you're going to be lazy enough to believe anything you read anywhere, whether it's in a Twitter or whether it's on a Facebook page, um, I would say then that's silly. I have met, I see people in the audience tonight who I have met on the internet um, through our conversations about politics and the world that we have reached out and become friends in real life. And I think that if you're not going to combine your social networking with an outreach to those people, then you're kind of risking being in your own head with your own thoughts and, and not really being out in the world. And I think as we were talking earlier, um, it's always really responsible and, and smart to put a face to opinions and remember that every time you're talking, whether it's on a machine or not, there's somebody with feelings and thoughts and a heart um, who cares as much as you do on the other end of that. And, and that's how you need to be respectful of people always. It's very easy to detach from the humanity of the conversation. So always try to, try to engage as much as you can in the humanity of the conversation, I guess. So mix it up. The short answer is mix it up. Two days ago, Jonathan Alter spoke from the same Yes, pulpit. I like him. I mentioned that you were speaking, and he said, well, she does fake news. <laughs> and then went on to say that it's very popular. Yes. Why is fake news popular? Because it's the real news now. In your remarks, you said they want to dumb down the news. Who are they? And why aren't the major news organizations challenging the fal falsehoods being told by them? They want to dumb down, I think, would be the people who are the second part of that question. I think corporate America, corporate news, there's a formula to all of it. Because I think the one thing that's often forgotten in corporate media is they're on the air because they need ratings so they can get advertising dollars. And it's not just about getting Fox getting more ratings than MSNBC. They're up against Monday Night Football and the top sitcom. All of those people are applying for the, you know, vying for the same advertising dollar. And so the they, they don't care as long as people are watching. Glenn Beck wouldn't have the numbers, he wouldn't be on the air if they cared about facts because Glenn Beck doesn't even present a fact-based show, he presents an emotion-based show. And you can't fact-check emotions, although on his case you can because he writes things on the blackboard that are crazy and about the axis and stuff and, you know, I, I don't know, Guam wasn't in the axis of any point in World War II and I don't know, it was weird. It's just bizarre. So they, they just want to perpetuate the clownery because it brings ratings. 
Why don't you create a new show, a new okay. show called The Facts Show? Um, here's the sad part of what I do and what I did, is because we're in a numbers game, I have tried nine ways to Sunday to do some kind of different version of responding to the world. The number one reason that the networks will not do another show is because there is no syndication money in it, meaning they can't sell those shows in five years and make money off of it. They don't understand the importance of having a bunch of varieties of getting it out there. It's about the bottom line in the dollar, which is why we launched this theater show in New York and this web show. It's important for me to just at least be out there being a voice in the world. And if the networks aren't going to do it, I'm willing to be on the box in your computer or wherever. It's important just to say it and be out there. So, yeah. As a comedian, can you suggest or imagine why it is that, that humor, humor seems to open people to hearing things in new ways, hearing facts? Well, I think it's funny. Humor, if you can laugh with someone, there is a com uh, you instantly have a common bond with them. And so that means that on some level, the two of you liked something that was the same. And it's really just that simple. If you can actually realize that you've just shared something that you like, it breaks down that wall of thinking that that person is Satan and the devil. And I think part of the national conversation that has become so incredibly dangerous is the demonization of the president to where why would you want to negotiate or make any deals with anything he has to say if he is as satanic and awful as he is being portrayed? We won't have any movement at all politically. And when that trickles down into forming these weird polarizing belief systems, um, it's going to be the same way. So humor is the breaking force. It just always is, you know? You say poop and people laugh. We have several questions about The Daily Show itself. A recent program had TV clips of eight different presidents, from Nixon to Obama, talking about programs to produce energy independence. How are you able to find all those TV clips? Um, well, C-SPAN has now opened up its library, and anything that's ever been on C-SPAN is now available, which is awesome. Um, I think you go to, um, you can go to a bunch of different sources that, uh, they have archives at news, you pay for it, you pay for it. Does John Stewart really read those books that he, <laughs> that he talks about with their authors, or do you simply give him a good synopsis? Oh, what's the next question? <laughs> That's what we thought. When, when do the writers begin each daily show? When did what? When did the writers begin each uh, preparing writing well, I'm each not there show? anymore, but it used to be that we would go in for work at, I guess it was like at 7.30. Um, and then we would have our first me meeting at 9. And then we would have our s the second meeting at 1.30. And then they would write, and then the third meeting would be at 5.30, and then the show would tape at 6.30, and then we'd have to tape till 7.30 again, lay the show down to make sure it got out on time, so, and then we'd leave about 9.30 at night. And the show would be rehearsed, and, and if something didn't go well, would you retape or? You can either retape or rewrite it on the fly, or, you know, I mean, a lot of stuff happens. Like, you could have a whole show planned, and then, you know, it, you're taping at 5.30, and at 3.30, Dick Cheney shoots somebody in the face, and you're like, <laughs> oh my god. <sighs> well, that's a bummer and a gift. <laughs> <laughs> you, you're doing just fine in the pulpit there, ladies. I just Am I doing good? Yeah, yeah. Uh, one of our uh, audience members Is says- Is that a picture of me at this pulpit? Uh, for the love of God. <laughs> okay. Mary, we have to get it to Mother. Okay. One of our listeners says this, thank you for saving our country in November 2008. What's your next big project? <sighs> well, since I've saved the country, I've decided... Um, 
I meant to say not that, God. Um, I did not say the car. That's funny. Um, we were afraid that might happen. Oh, so late. I was doing good, too. Gosh, I was doing so good, and then it all, like, gosh. Oh, I'm not worthy anymore of the pulpit. <laughs> I'm writing a book right now. Um, I am writing a book of, um, I came to my politics basically through a lot of trial and error in life. And so there are personal essays about um, just things that I've been through in life that sort of led me to the belief system that I have. Um, and hopefully it'll be funny and interesting and inspiring, and you'll buy it. <laughs> so that's what I'm doing now. I'm also touring the country, doing theaters. Um, one thing that there isn't a lot of out there in the world of stand-up and what I do is somebody who is responding comedically to the news basically as it's happening. So I'm doing small theaters around the country, and I am actually doing basically the biggest news stories of the week and tackling them, or of the last two weeks, but and tackling up to the minute stuff. So if I was performing tonight, I would be talking about stuff that happened today. No. What is it about being a Minnesotan led you to where you are today? Well, your background, growing up in Minneapolis, Southwest High School? You know, it's funny. A lot of it had to do with my parents were very, very conservative, and I grew up in Southwest Minneapolis. You know, and um, er no one ever believed anything my parents believed. <laughs> Zero people. I'd walk out the door and it'd be like, no, that isn't right at all. Um, <laughs> but I really, it, it, seriously, the thing I love about Minnesota so much are two things. And one of them is the fact that they still make Wellstone bumper stickers. <laughs> and. When you see a Wellstone bumper sticker or a lawn sign, I know what kind of person you are and what your belief system is. A Wellstone Democrat is a thing. It's a, it's a way of life, and I love that. I mean, that's kind of my adult re reaction, but really, um, Minnesotans have this thing that you just help people because you can. And it's just that simple, you know? And it makes me want to cry when I, because I, I, I love being from here. And and forget about the passive aggressive stuff because that exists. But um, <laughs> don't kid yourselves. But I do feel like um, someone said to me once, you know, you just help. You, you call up somebody and you go, I'm in trouble. I need money. I need help. And they find a way. So it's a good place. Thank you, Liz Winstead.